All right. Well, it is noon here at One Schoolhouse, so it's time for What's New This Week at One Schoolhouse. I'm Sarah Hannawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development, and I'm glad to be back here. I've had a couple of weeks with Brad doing the webinar, so it's nice to be back. And today with me, I have Sonia Bell, and Sonia has got a lot to offer, so I'm just going to share my screen, and we will get going. So we're going to talk this week about an essential relationship, college counselors and academic leaders, and how we can um, leverage that relationship to serve students and families better. On our blog, I wrote this this week after my planning conversation with Sonia, because I felt like I wanted to take her out for a cup of coffee for sure. So academic leaders, that's the title of my blog. Take your college counselor out for coffee and learn a little bit uh, about what they've got for you. Um, if you're not on the academic leaders listserv, please join us. Here's the link so that you can sign up and join the listserv. And if you're not getting our newsletters, we would welcome you and we'd love to add you to our list. We uh, do, will not fill up your inbox every day, we promise. So if you go to our blog and read about taking the college counselor out for coffee and you want to make sure you don't miss another blog post, sign up for our newsletter. And then this week, we asked a question of our community that was a little bit different from some of the ones that we've asked before and really targeted it at this particular webinar. So besides college counseling, what role do college counselors play at your school? And Sonia, you and I had a chance to look at this and I'm gonna ask you if you wouldn't mind, um, what do you think? Sure, I was a little bit surprised when I saw that 57% of college counselors teach a class. And one of the questions I have is, are they teaching um, classes that will help students to understand the college process better? Uh, or are they teaching more of the core disciplines like in arts or music or history, English, science, language, um, math, like those kinds of classes. So that was one of the questions that, um, that I had. Um, but it didn't surprise me. I think that a lot of college counselors wear so many different hats. And I just love seeing this chart. And I think it's something that our academic leaders should see as well. Right. So we thought that rather than kicking this off with the introduction, which we usually do, and we will get to that shortly, if you're here and live, would you share in the chat if your college counselor teaches a class, is it within a, another discipline at your school or is it a class specifically for college counseling? We'd love to see that in the chat. And then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And we'll get into a more traditional introduction here. But Sonia, welcome. I'm so Thank glad you. to have you here. Could Thank you, you for having me. Tell everybody a little bit about you, your school, and your role there. Sure. Um, I have been at St. Luke's for 14 years. Um, prior to that, I started actually, I started my career in 1985. I graduated from Spelman College. And then my first job was teaching at Choate Rosemary Hall. I taught English. And since then, I've been at um, two, counting St. Luke's, actually three independent schools. I've worked at three universities, um, and now I am director of college counseling. Uh, I also teach English um, for about eight years. I taught, or seven years, I taught junior, so I taught American Lit, and now I'm teaching two senior electives. Well, I didn't realize you were teaching two sections. Yeah, one, one in the fall and one in the spring. So definitely not at the same time. <clears throat> okay, I was gonna say, I don't know how you do that. that. <laughs> so this month we've been talking about the relationships between academic leaders and other leaders on campus. And so when you and I were talking, I was really amazed at how quickly you identified how you interacted with just about everyone on campus. And I know that is something that our audience is gonna be impressed too when, we see, when they see the list. But you're doing really important work that could inspire others. So I want to start with something that might surprise people. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the business office? Sure. So I have a great relationship with the business office. And it started because we had a family that heard my pleas at board meetings about how difficult it is for so many of our families who are receiving tuition assistance, but they're not to the point of being eligible for free lunch. They're not what we would consider in poverty, 
but they really can't afford college application fees. They can't afford um, to take the SAT more than one or two times. Because um, <clears throat> even my state of Connecticut, UConn, costs like $80 to apply. Um, and then even past that, there are so many expenses uh, that families incur if they travel to C schools. So, um, and this is in conjunction with the development office, um, a great family started a fund that my office uses to help students to pay for these fees, um, helps families go to visit colleges. So it, it pays for tolls, airfare, train, meals uh, for the entire family. So uh, I work with the business office to make sure checks are dispersed properly. And they're so great. They know that um, this is an important part of what we do. And they are all about equity and making sure that our, all families have an equal opportunity. So we work very closely together to make sure checks are cut and that my credit card has enough cash on it or you know, to, to be able to have families go where they want to go to see schools. I love that you mentioned tolls. I live in the Southeast and toll roads are not really part of our existence. And every time I drive up um, a little further north, I'm stunned at how much it costs <laughs> just to get around. So Especially in the New York, uh, New Jersey area, it's so expensive. And we don't want that to prohibit anyone. So again, that's why uh, that's one way I work with the business office. I think that level of support for families is really inspiring. I think that's something you can really be proud of. Um, so I think if you have something on your campus, a story that's similar that you think others might find interesting, please add that in the chat too, and we'll share those afterwards. But when you think about, you know, other campus connections that you've got and things that you do, um, you mentioned athletics. So can you tell us about some of the other areas on campus that might surprise people that you connect to? Sure. Um, I think at a lot of independent schools, we are expected to contribute to something outside of the school day. So running at clubs and activities, but because college counselors, um, you know, we don't have that, of course, we don't have a nine to five, but, you know, sometimes the only time we could see students maybe three or four or five o'clock. So a lot of times we're exempt from doing after school activities or duties. And not only am I a college counselor, so I'm exempt as an administrator, but also I've been uh, in education for over 35 years. So any of uh, those of us who were, you know, have done this more than 35 years, we don't have to do an activity. But every year I choose to do something. So for the past 13 years, I've been the operator of the varsity baseball um, scoreboard. And for over 10 years, I run the varsity girls basketball shot clock, even though I can be honest, I didn't know a whole lot about basketball when I took this on. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it makes me want to keep my day job. I mean, that's very stressful. But um, yes. <laughs> the reason I do it is because I know, for one, that a lot of schools rely on their athletic department. So many kids are recruited to play a sport in college. And that really helps us out when we don't have to do a whole lot to help kids to gain admission to schools because, you know, they've been able to be at the top of their game in sports and athletics and these coaches have built these students and have given them so many opportunities to perform, I'm gonna give back. So the least thing I can do is do a scoreboard or to do the shot clock. Um, but the other thing too, is that as a college counselor, I'm sitting there and I'm hearing what's going on in the dugout, which makes it so great for me to write recommendations or hearing what's going on on the bench or looking at the audience, looking at the fans, looking at the crowd and building stories. And I love when parents see me not dressed up, but they see me in sweatpants and a t-shirt. And then they know I know their kids. Like I'm really involved. I'm getting from behind the desk. You know, you sound a little bit like the creative writer who hangs out in coffee shops, eavesdropping on conversations so that they, and you never know if you'll make it into a play or something. I'm really, really intrigued by that. Oh, I do that. <laughs> So some other areas you mentioned, development and admissions and even facilities. So what are some relationships that you have there? Sure. Um, I'll start with facilities. Um, we have a beautiful campus 
And every time uh, a college representative, um, and we have about 150 that came to campus before COVID. So now it's probably about 80 that will physically visit campus. But in previous years, we've had up to 150 schools come. And when they drive up the driveway, and they're all coming from these amazing schools and these amazing campuses, and they've been to visit a lot of amazing schools and you know secondary schools, but almost all of them drive up and say, wow, this is one of the most beautiful campuses I've ever seen. And what that means, there's some facilities people who are working really hard to make sure that that drive up for those college reps is spectacular. And so, um, you know, it gives off a great first impression. So when, uh, you know, we have, uh, when there's snow that needs to be cleaned to get the campus open, um, I know that the person who usually comes in and uses the key to open up the blinds, he can't do it, he's out shoveling snow. So I just take my key and I go around and I look at everything that they would have done had they not had to clear snow. And I do it because again, they help me out and I'm like, I can, I can help them out as well. So, um, and then with development, um, we have a great relationship because, um, you know, development offices realize that they want to keep a connection with students. And the last real interaction that families are going to have uh, before graduation is going to be the college office. So we want to make sure that that last memory that they have is going to be a great one. And uh, development will often call us to say, you know, how are things going um, with students? Because we don't want to call a family if a student has just been deferred at five or six schools. We're like, nope, don't do that yet. Or if the family has gotten great news, we'd be like, okay, go ahead. But they realize too that, um, you know, so much of what happens in the senior year is about college counseling. And so we partner in, in that area as well. You know, what I like about the way you describe everything is that all of those relationships that you have with other campus leaders are supporting students. And so you think about the student who's coming in on the day when facilities needs to be scraping snow and their, their classroom is still ready for them because you've gone behind the scenes and made that happen. And I think that's just something um, I, yours, I don't know if everyone appreciates that or even knows it, because it sounds to me like some of this you might be doing really quietly. So here it is announced on the webinar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, there could be little things when um, a popular school comes to visit St. Luke's and we don't have a space big enough. We know we can call facilities and say, we're so sorry, but can you all stop what you're doing and bring us 10 chairs? And they do it. Or when we need the athletic center, because again, we didn't expect so many kids to come to a particular visit. And athletics may say, okay, we're gonna move PE to another room, you can have it. And again, it's because we look at this as being a partnership and I love it because what, what you just said is because it's really not about me or about my office, it's really about serving kids. Yeah. So when there's a new leader or a change on campus and someone's in a leadership role that they weren't in before, how do you go about connecting and building new relationships? Um, my office is one of the first offices that most um, new administrators and faculty come to. And it's because um, we are probably the only office that will have hour long meetings with kids and families. And we're kind of like in no hurry. Um, we don't have to rush to get anywhere. So, um, you know, we have a lot of families who, you know, they just go through the process. They, you know, sign their kids up and, you know, they don't make any waves and nobody really hears from them. But from college counseling, we're like, nope, we got to hear from you. So we have a couple of hour long meetings with families and, and we hear, you know, very clearly um, from families. They're, they're never really asked many questions. So we ask an awful lot of questions. Some of them have to do with college counseling, others don't, or they'll just volunteer information. And what we do is we'll say like, okay, there's nothing we could do about that, but we can contact the, you know, the music department chair to know how families are feeling about this. Or um, we can contact uh, the development office to say, you know what, when you had that affair, this is what some of the families thought about it. So we're sort of the repository of all of this information and we deliver it back out to the people who, who definitely um, need to hear. Um, you know, we work with new faculty a lot because so many of them feel pressured that, okay, we're teaching um, 
at this school where a lot of students want to go to some of the most selective schools and we're free to give the grade that they deserve. And we're like, nope, we have your back. We will never ask you to change a grade. We want you to be, you know, true to the grade. So they know we have their backs. Um, so again, we're, we're the first counseling services. They come and meet with us because again, we know a lot of things about students that most other teachers and administrators don't know. You know, I'm just trying to imagine the school that uh, wanted to send a note out to families and say, we'd like to do an hour long um, interview with you about your experience here. I mean, you would not get a huge sign up, I think, for two or three hour long meetings, and yet you're able to have those. And that's a, that's a really, that's a font of information. Um, so when you think about how that area of knowledge is critical to the school, and that can be academic change. And I know that made a few people just kind of swivel back to their screen if they're doing something else too. So when there's academic change, how do you, how do you participate in that? Um, I sit in on the, uh, I sit on the academic council and um, my lens, the bill lens through which I see everything is from the college standpoint. And I have to wear a lot of different hats. I think about students and their experience. I think of parent reaction, but I also think about college admission officers. So as we're debating what we're going to do, are we going to, um, you know, continue to have three years of a language? Are we going to move away from APs? Are we going to, um, even the changing of the titles of courses, you know, all of that I have to be involved with, because again, I have to think about um, the different perspectives that people are gonna have when they look at the courses that we offer. Yeah, and I just want to remind everybody, if you've got something to drop in the chat, share it with everybody. And then if you've got a question, please put it in the Q&A and we definitely will have some time for questions at the end. So what do you wish your academic colleagues knew more about your work and your role at school? There are a lot of things. Um, I think sometimes we're all grouped into, you know, we arrive at 745 and, you know, some of us leave at four o'clock. But you know, what I would love for them to realize and know is that there's really no set time for our work. There's set time for teachers to teach their classes. Uh, they even have time built in the day for students to have free periods so that they can do their homework. Uh, but when it comes to the college process, there really is no time designated. So they have to do it whenever they can. And oftentimes that means doing it on weekends. So we don't want to kind of hold a kid who's working on an essay on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock and wants to get most of it done that weekend, we don't want to say like, okay, we're going to answer you on Monday. You know, classroom teachers can do that. We kind of can't do that. Um, so I think that I, I want them to understand the kinds of hours that we have to work because we have to accommodate when students have time um, mm -hmm. to, to do these things. Uh, I also wish that they would, academic leaders would either... Well, first, I wish they would uh, listen in on group information sessions because they need to hear what students and families are hearing when they visit these colleges and listen to group information sessions. Um, when we decided to move past APs, I told our academic leaders, I said, if you listen to any group information session, they're usually going to say, we want to see students who are challenging themselves by taking AP classes. Some of them will say AP, IB, honors, whatever it is, advanced, whatever the highest level is that's offered by your school. But a lot of admission officers kind of stop at APs. And mm -hmm. so when, um, when families are panicking and they want to get their kids into these honors and AP classes, they got, they've got to know this is where they're hearing it from. Um, the other thing I think is uh, I wish academic administrators would take a couple of kits themselves. Like every year, say, or every other year, say, I'm going to take two or three um, students. I'll do them in partnership with you. But I think it's important for them to see how, um, again, unlike classroom teachers, we are working. It, it, it's like we have 30 independent studies going on. Mm -hmm. and there's no one size fits all. Everybody is on a different calendar. Um, you can't set arbitrary deadlines. You can't say that um, I want your essays by 
you know, October 15th, when you know in actuality, it doesn't have to be in until November 1st. So just, in, just because October 15th works for you, it's really an arbitrary deadline. And for some students, they need up until that last moment. So you kind of feel like you don't have as much control as you have when you're a classroom teacher. Really interesting. And you mentioned something before too about the level of personalization and how it doesn't sometimes lend itself to the, the kind of summary presentation that an academic leader might want to give to a group of parents. Correct. I mean, one other thing I should say is that, um, yeah, they, they want to have this one size fits all approach. And, um, you know, for us, for instance, like professional development, whereas for most faculty members, professional development is something that you can do during the summer or in your free time. Well, we're expected to know everything about every college. So we're reading the Chronicle to see what's going on. Um, you know, I can't tell a student like, you know, Barnard has this thing called nine ways of knowing when that went out of fashion in, in 2016. So if I'm not current, I'm giving information that is no longer current. And um, some parents may start to question my knowledge. So it's one of those things where we have to keep current. Um, if schools are offering, that used to offer ED are now only offering early action, we have to know that. If schools are adding an early action, we need to know that. If schools are no longer allowing students to apply directly to their business program, we need to know that. Um, so all of those changes, families expect us to be the experts. And so professional development for us is every day clicking on every email from every college to see if there's something that we should know. So there is that kind of pressure. It's like we're, we're teaching a current events class, mm -hmm. you know, every, every day. You know, so I'm just going to say this to academic leaders who are watching this later or here now. So the answer to a, when a college counselor says, I need to learn about this, can you support me? The answer needs to be yes, <laughs> right? So I'll, I'll give you that plug. And then something else that you mentioned that I thought was really interesting is that you are also that source of information about what does it feel like to be on a school? And if it's one that um, you know is far away and you've not sent a student there before, then you may have to say, well, go and find out. But if it's somewhere near, you need to visit those campuses and see, oh my gosh, they've built a brand new freshman dorm and the living experience is completely different from what it used to be like. So there's a little bit of travel that you need to do as well. Yeah. Um, and again, we're fortunate that we have a pretty robust budget to travel, but I think that um, counselors feel better when they've actually been on the campus. Um, you want to have as, as much knowledge as the families in front of you. And when they're talking about things and they will say things like, you know how at the this university, the campus is, and you're like, nope, no, I don't, <laughs> have no idea. Um, and I think the more you see, the more confident as a counselor you feel in terms of having those conversations with families, but also making recommendations because you don't want to make a recommendation and you're like, darn it, if I had seen that before, I probably never would have done that. So I think you really need to invest in travel experiences and also giving them time. Um, you know, sometimes counselors are expected to do it on their vacations, but it's like finding the time when it's not vacation, it's, it's work when you're going to visit these schools. But I think that's a huge investment in, in counselors. So I'm gonna shift our focus just a little bit because um, the other thing that you do with students that I think academic leaders could learn from is you are working with families during some of the most emotionally fraught times in their lives, right? And, and that might be revolving specifically around a college decision, but it's also because Maybe it's their oldest or their youngest child, and they're just emotional about this child leaving the home and going up to college. There's a lot of emotion. How do you build your, your soft interpersonal skills? They call them soft skills, but they're interpersonal. They're super important. And I don't, sorry, I use the word soft now that I said that, but, but how do you build those and how can you um, help others with that? Um, so I try to understand where families are. And instead of getting angry and saying, why are you sending me 10 emails? Huh. I'm like, hmm. okay, I'm wondering what's going on that makes you send me 10 emails. I've got to understand where you're coming from because I've got to guess that you probably don't want to be sending me 10 email emails, but there's something going on. So let me get to the root 
of what's going on. Um, if I have irate parents, I'm like, okay, you're not angry with me. I know you're not angry with me, but I've got to figure out, okay, why are you angry? What's going on? So I think um, being more, uh, less reactive and more, you got to be curious. You got to want to know the whys. And if you, if, and that to me is more important. And that's why I think successful counselors aren't reactive. They listen and they're curious and they try to figure out the whys and it makes it easier to approach, makes it easier to approach any, any situation. I also think you, you know, you remain calm um, and, and, and respectful. And then you always have to know, uh, families always have to know I'm on your kid's side. Like I'm, you know, when, when uh, a family is so upset because a student didn't get the grades that they thought they either deserved or need to get into a school. I'm like, nope, that grade can stay. Look, it's going to work out okay. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. I don't say what fine is, <laughs> but <laughs> as long as they see that I'm not panicking, like, oh boy, you got to see, whoo, what are we going to do? Um, the other thing I do is to keep emotion out of it because we're often uh, charged with supporting a student, but also being very realistic. And you don't want to get that to be that at that point where families say, okay, you don't think my kid can get in, right? And I'm like, no, I didn't say that. I'm just look at the number. So what I will do is I'll take off any identifying information and say, okay, in the past five years, here are some transcripts of students who were admitted to the schools that you want to go to. So that way you can just compare. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes me out of it. And I was like, okay. Here's the stuff you do with it, whatever you want to do with it. But sometimes you have to kind of take yourself out of the situation. I think that's really good advice. Um, really good strategies for communicating. And I think that would probably be a great sort of on-campus workshop for other academic leaders and teachers on communicating during highly emotional times, because that is something that we are all doing now, <laughs> um, more so than maybe we've been. So. What other advice do you have for others about thinking, about communicating with students in a way that can help them look forward, right? Um, what, I would, um, what I would say is, um, I guess the only advice I could give is to kind of put yourself in that person's shoes and um, just try to have a little bit more empathy and know that they're going through, it's not gonna be the toughest time of their lives, but at that point they think it is. <laughs> they really yeah, they think it is. And we've been through it so many times, um, but we have to remember like I approach every kid as though this is my first time going through this process. So I'm on this journey with them so I can get excited with them as opposed to checking off boxes. So, I, you know, I approach it like the, the wonderment and the wide eyes. And, and when they see I'm engaged and excited and not checking off boxes, they are happy to go along for the ride. And I think academic administrators um, should think about the individual student and, and, and again, be a classroom student. I mean, I, I hope more academic leaders sit in on classes just to mm -hmm. see um, what, that, what their students are experiencing. So we've got an interesting question here, which is that students are often trying to find what the, should be the right answer rather than what's their answer. And I think that applies to so much more than just a college application. How do you guide students through that? Um, what we do is we, we like to, uh, I don't wanna say trick kids, but we like to ask them questions that they have absolutely no idea this is really, um, uh, that this is this is really about um, about college. So we ask them to tell us stories about things. We oftentimes will, um, you know, say things like like we'll look at some college supplements. And a lot of college supplements are really fun. Yeah. And, and like, what is your favorite movie line? Uh, what what shows do you binge watch? Um, what's your favorite uh, website? Uh, give us your top 10 list, which is a Wake Forest one. Another one is, you know, uh, right now, give us this playlist to what's going on in your life. And, um, you know, once students see that this is really about them exploring more about them, there are no right or wrong answers, just answers that reflect them. So a lot of times we start off with things like that to get them thinking more about themselves and thinking of this as being 
fun and more of an exploration and more about them as opposed to the name of the school. And it just makes it a better process. So I feel like there's some real life advice in that too. And I think that might be a great way to close, which is maybe folks, one of the things that we could do was we go into our um, Thanksgiving is just make our own playlist and you don't need context, right? Just here's my playlist for where I am right now. And I'm not going to explain why this is my playlist. is just, here it is. And then put it on Spotify and play it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sonia, I can't thank you enough for um, just coming on today, demystifying a little bit about your job and because I know a lot of times people look in and you know, she's you know she's always in there with students it's hard to catch her so let's just remind everybody take that college counselor out for coffee and find out what they know so there's an awful lot thank, thank you, you so much that. for having me all right goodbye everybody we we won't be here next week we will be um, either cooking or preparing to eat <laughs> or one of those other things and then we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>